I owe the fact that I'm an anarchist to my parents and to San Pedro Cactus. I, I said, San Pedro seems like people uh, don't like money. Uh, should we just get rid of it? Would that make life easier? So that was an eight hour uh, experience that gave me, you know, a master's degree, basically, of like economic policy. I, I think that San Pedro is extremely, or Huachuma is extremely anarchist and, and really respects the non-aggression principle because, um, you know, the first four or five times that I did it, I would tell my wife, you know, my experience that I saw the cactus. And I mean, it was not talking like with a mouth, but like the image of a cactus. And then I would get some sort of like telepathic knowledge. So I would know what he was telling me my wife was like ah, that freaks me i don't want to do that i don't want to see a cactus talking to me <laughs> imagine that those words in the book are the san pedro cactus on the ground so he wrote the book in another dimension and those words are the san pedro cactus so when you're reading that book you're entering into the mind the dimension i was in an ayahuasca experience um a weekend retreat and uh with my wife and then the shaman from peru he said um explaining to the newcomers um, said, you know, the ceremony may last five or six hours, maybe the rest of your life. And everybody laughed. And I was like, no shit. So I'm here with uh, Luis Fernando Mises, and uh, you've just been speaking today ab about, um, I think you described it as, as conscious capitalism or like... Uh, servant leadership. Servant leadership, right. <laughs> like uh, changing, changing the structures of, of companies to make it so uh, the bosses serve people and help people and support people. Uh, but I know you're also into, well, you're into a, a range of things. You're also into shamanism. Uh, and this is, it's kind of cool because it's this, this big contrast. Uh, like you're, you're focused on economics and leadership and shamanism and, and, uh, also about firearms. You, <laughs> that's one of your passions. Can you tell us about, um, about being a shaman with guns? <laughs> Sure. Um, I I don't see them necessarily as um, you know contrasting. I see them as the like the face of a diamond. They're just a different face, and they all belong to the same thing. Um, I I think it's um, honestly I feel a little bit weary of somebody that claims uh, spirituality yet frowns upon um, gun ownership. And that may sound a little weird, but the idea is if you support, um, you know, banning guns, uh, that doesn't mean that guns are going to disappear. That only means that guns are going to go to government officials. And to me, that is more of a threat to the life and property of people, and they cannot defend themselves. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want the karma. I don't want, like, I would rather have them kill me. And to me, it's like, okay, that's kind of stupid because <laughs> then you're not going to be here anymore. And then if you have children or a wife or husband, you know, uh, how are you going to take care of them? So uh, I think that the logical um, answer is to be able to defend yourself. And I often quote the Bhagavad Gita because, as you've read in that book, um, the, the, you can be, you can receive a great level of enlightenment and still play the role in your physical form in, in defending uh, your life and your property and your family. Mm. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, so really, it's, it's, it's completely consistent in your view. All of this really comes together quite nicely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I remember to, today during your, your speech, you, you mentioned something about a, a St. Pedro experience that you had. Uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, the one about money? Yeah. Okay, so um, at the time, well, I think I I owe the fact that I'm an anarchist to my parents and to some Pedro Cactus. And um, one time, you know, I was still, uh, you know, a Ron Paul supporter, uh, libertarian, and I was still struggling with the idea that a lot of people kind of disliked the concept of money. So I, I my purpose of that trip or that experience uh, that journey was 
I, I said, San Pedro seems like people uh, don't like money. Uh, should we just get rid of it? Would that make life easier? So that was an eight hour uh, experience that gave me, you know, a master's degree basically of like economic policy. And I was able to see how um, the idea of money is extremely sophisticated and helpful. Um, but the problem is that it's nationalized, it's socialist money in like everywhere in the world. They have, there's like um, a government issuing currency, and that's the real problem, not the fact that there's money. Because even if we get rid of money, we'll, we'll go back to it in some form by um, trading. So it's a great tool for trade. The main issue is whomever is printing it. All right, great point. So St. Pedro actually talks to you and uh, like, would you say, is it the cactus talking to you or the saint or it, uh, it's, a, it's a spirit or, or how would you describe that? Uh, okay, well, great, great question. San Pedro, uh, and I refer to it as San Pedro because that's how most people know it, but its real name is Huachuma. Whenever the Spaniards came, um, they were banning all these kinds of um, ceremonies because they thought they were like evil and the devil was involved in all that. But the name San Pedro stayed uh, on the in the underground um, ceremonies because they they you know overlapping the idea that San Pedro is the gatekeeper of heaven. So when you drink San Pedro, you're able to open up your self uh, to a higher, um, I guess, uh, more of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see more. It opens the gates of heaven. So. Okay, that, that's, you know, the difference between San Pedro and Huachuma, like the name of it. Now, San Pedro is not related really to, to the cacti, cactus in, its, in itself. Um, so who talks to you? Like, I, I think that San Pedro is extremely, or Huachuma is extremely anarchist and, and really respects the non-aggression principle because, uh, you know, the first four or five times that I did it, I would tell my wife, you know, my experience that I saw the cactus. And I mean, it was not talking like with a mouth, but like the image of a cactus. And then I would get some sort of like telepathic knowledge. So I would know what he was telling me. My wife was like, ah, that freaks me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to see a cactus talking to me. <laughs> so after, you know, some convincing and she did it, uh, San Pedro was in the background as a voice, as a knowing. Uh, so... If something, if you're not comfortable with something, he's not going to necessarily talk to you in that regard. He will uh, be able to, he knows what you're comfy with, and then he will work with you in that um, that specific scope. Okay, so very comforting and, and like hold your hand and guide you right along. Well, that's kind of funny that you say that because that's exactly what it is, like the idea that... Um, if you have, like when you, you uh, talk about your purpose for that specific... Um, journey, uh, it seems like he, and this is figuratively speaking, right? He holds you by the hand. It feels like a grandfather energy holds you by the hand and you get to see all sorts of things. And then at the end of that journey, you have the answer and you're like, oh, look at that. I just figured this out. But all along, he took you and saw you, uh, showed you all these things that connected to the point where you found the answer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, uh, to me, it's a very noble way of teaching. And it's not like, okay, little boy, listen, this is what you need to learn, you know? Um, so that's why I prefer San Pedro, uh, I guess, versus ayahuasca, because ayahuasca is more like, you're here, like a stern grandma, you know, wash your feet, wash your, wash your hands, uh, clean your room, and, and I'm going to smack you. And then at the end of the day, here's some cookies, my darling. <laughs> Like you get a bunch of goodies at the end of the day, but you you have to work really, really, really hard. Like you're puking and you're shitting your pants and like you're like, ah, you know, and then like you have some like amazing um, views and, and perspectives and knowledge and wisdom and, and enlightenment and all that. But, you know, like I like the gentle um, ways of San Pedro a little better. It seems to me it's more forgiving. Now, the taste is horrible. Mm. But it is more forgiving uh, in that regard, um, it, it, like the energy of it. So you said that like San Pedro has the, this this grandfatherly energy, and I, um, I'm sure you'd describe uh, ayahuasca as more motherly, right? Yeah. So grandmotherly, gra uh, grandmotherly even. Okay. So uh, do you think that these two spirits have have any relationship, or is there any earthly way of 
of knowing if they if like maybe they represent a kind of divine feminine divine masculine or or uh, some part of your brain or anything like that i don't think they're related i think they do work with your unconscious mind i think they activate um a lot of uh things that make you go to um the primal part of your brain so you get to like experience feel see touch smell a lot of memories from the past um but one time i was actually um um holding space for uh, ceremony and you know like the people they were fine they were okay so i just kind of sat down meditated closed my eyes and i was asking so tell me more about yourself and so basically what san pedro was telling me was um he was showing me how he's in a higher dimension and the cactus is kind of like its work zipping through towards the third dimension in, in, in a way to help us achieve a uh, higher purpose, enlightenment, whatever. So in, in another words, uh, I'll explain this to you. Whatever work you do in this three-dimensional form affects other dimensions as well. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when you write a book, the words on the book are also, um, are, imagine that those words in the book are the San Pedro cactus on the ground. So he wrote the book in another dimension and those words are the San Pedro cactus. So when you're reading that book, you're entering into the mind, the dimension of this, like, you know, my favorite writer, Jorge Luis Borges, when I'm reading his books, I'm not seeing him. I'm not like, that, that's only his writing. And, but I'm, I'm able to enter to his mind, to his brain and learn a lot of things. The same way happens when you do shitty work, like people are able like to, to be affected by your work and in a negative way. So that's kind of like the, the purpose of excellence and your work to be able to affect positively, hopefully, you know, uh, lower dimensions and higher dimensions. So that's kind of where he said, like the example of the book. So it, it kind of sounds like with this, if, if you have this perspective on the world, it's like to, to beings of, of lower consciousness but below us, we could be ca kind of like gods and we have the, all this responsibility to make sure we don't put them through a, a shitty time unintentionally. Yeah, and I think that the, the main thing is awareness um, in and of itself is transformative. The more aware that you become, your problems will start melting away and you start seeing from a higher perspective and you see how every action of yours uh, affects either positively or, ne or negatively uh, everything and everyone around you. So like the idea, for instance, of Tantra, uh, like the whole idea that even cooking, like whatever your whatever consciousness, state of consciousness that you are while you're cooking, that energy will go inside of you. So anything that you do, like when you say hi to somebody, like you're, you're affecting and imprinting your energy there. If, if like, you know, shitty bosses, for example, like people don't quit work, they, qu they qu quit their bosses. So like how the, all of your actions, like in your family, um, the, the virtuous cycle versus the vicious cycle, like spanking and, and hitting and yelling versus like, you know, the, the whole term of servant leadership again, but like peaceful parenting. How can you create aware and virtuous cycles? So, yes, I mean, it affects everything in your um, circle of um, that, that you can reach. So, by the way, I, I did think I did tell you about my ayahuasca trip because I, I was mentioning it to you before before I took it, like a few days before. Yeah. Actually, it was it wasn't quite as bad as what, as what you said with puking and stuff. I didn't I didn't even purge. I didn't have diarrhea or anything though. I did uh, I, I did do a quite a lot of dry reaching towards the end, but it was kind of uh, I guess the the purging that I was doing was was um, some uh suffering like uh had, had to go through that suffering to like you said get the get the cookies at the end <laughs> 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 yeah um and uh but it it is kind of like the experience that i had was kind of similar to to what you're describing in the, in that um like it was it was a step by step progress uh process like uh here's one lesson here's um and uh ayahuasca would keep presenting me these memories and, and i would say uh okay that's interesting what's the lesson here what's <laughs> why are you showing me this and she would say 
this and this and this. <laughs> uh, and it, it was cool because it was it was very methodical. It was like a, it was like she had a lesson plan or like she was writing an essay and the you know these are the this is the body of the essay and this is this is a, the logical cl- conclusion yeah unavoidable conclusion <laughs> yeah i love that so like the you know in that regard the way i see it is kind of like when you hire a consultant and you give them like free access to like your database mm. and then they figure out what's wrong with your system and then they tell you okay you need to work on this and this and this and this mm. and and um then you're like, okay, I don't want to have to deal with this. And they're like, no, you have to. Otherwise, your system's going to continue to get clogged up and you're going to, you know, like it's going to be more expensive or you're going to get sick or whatever. So that's kind of like uh, the analogy that I see. So mm-hmm. once you're able to, um, like, you don't have to forget about the situations. You don't have to, this, like, like the teachings happen for a reason, so letting go of the pain and re, like keeping what you learned is the point of it. Like you're supposed to heal and learn and grow from it instead of like, th- there's only, I guess, in my perspective, two ways of doing something like you either like close your heart and, you know, stay stuck and cry for the rest of your life that this happened to you or you open your heart and like life is going to be suffering anyway. So might as well, you know, like go through it. And, and I think Rumi said that your heart has to be broken many times before it breaks open. So how can you maintain that openness? And, and I think that uh, these teaching plans help you uh, maintain that openness. And honestly, um, I cry during movies now, like um, I'm able to connect with people in a more empathetic level. I didn't used to be like that. I used to be an elitist, son of a bitch, spoiled brat, <laughs> honestly. So because of this work and because of all the work like skills that I've learned in my work, I've been able to get to a point that like that I'm describing. So, I mean, these things are extremely powerful. Fantastic. So how did you get into shamanism in, in the beginning? Is it a, a family tradition or something else? Okay, that, that that's a two-point thing. Number one, um, it's not a family tradition, but it is. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> so my mother, since I was little, I remember she's always been able to see spirits and feel things and know when people is go- like are going to die before they die. Mm-hmm. And then it happens. And like, that's been always the weirdest thing. And she freaks out about it and she doesn't want to face it. But I'm like, mother, this is a gift. You have to use it. She's terrified of it. But I think that a lot of it is because of the Catholic background, you know, like that's witchcraft that you shouldn't be able to see those things. Like she's tapping into um, space time continuum and in full consciousness as it is emerging. And she, that freaks her out. And I mean, quite honestly, it would freak anybody out if you don't have the proper training. So, I think that I have, like, um, because of my mother, I, I have some of those, um, I guess, what would you call them, gifts or um, something like that. So <laughs> crazy ideas. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I didn't, my mom never did any of that. But um, the way I learned it, I was going through my uh, yoga instructor certification. And one of the teachers um, I hit it off with him and we were hanging out, we were talking and he was already way ahead of me. He started teaching me about shamanism. I went to his house, we did some Pedro for the first time. Um, I, he's the one that talked, took me to an ayahuasca ceremony. He even paid for it. I was like, you need to try this. I'll pay for it. I was like, all right, dude. So we did it. And, um, from then on, like I, you know, I had him teaching me and then I kind of adopted another mentor. Uh, from Costa Rica, um, really great shaman. And I have an interview with him on my channel. Um, so he's also helped me through a lot. And, and like, this is not something that is all hunky dory. It's extremely difficult. Like I was reading something that said the only two reasons why people get into this kind of work is because number one, they're stupid or number two, they don't know what they're getting into. Mm. So <laughs> quite honestly i think i'm both <laughs> because you know i didn't know what i was getting into it's completely it's nothing of what i imagined but i'm i continue it so i must be kind of stupid aside from that because it's like really hard work and it's ruthless and, and but it, 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 like you get cookies in the end <laughs> i mean it, it's 
it's just like opened my life in a way that I'm, I've been able to affect positively, I hope, uh, a lot of other people around me. And, and, and that as I am empowered through that, I am able to empower others. And then I see how that uh, chain reaction continues in a fractal way. Mm. And it's fantastic to see that. Like, mm. it's really cool to be able to witness that. So, yeah, I mean, my mom and the yoga instructor, that's my friend. And uh, apropos, like, the, he had an app company. He was making games on Facebook. He sold his company or most of it, and then he started his retreat in Peru. So he's living there now, my teacher. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I have, I've had that experience, like, what you're talking about, the, the fractal effect. At least, um, like, um, one... Uh, one one degree, not, like I haven't seen it like echo through an entire society or <laughs> echo yeah, through a friends yeah. group. Yeah, I guess it, well, it would be difficult to see, yeah. but you have to imagine. Like I, I remember, I was um, my friend in Mexico City was was giving me a lift, and she said so we we were talking about peaceful parenting or children or something, and she and she said, "Oh, I would never want to have children," and and I just asked her a, a few questions and and. All of a sudden, she was like breaking down and in, in tears. Um, all this, all this um, trauma from a from a childhood just came back like in an instant. Um, and so, you know, I I comforted comforted her and 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 uh, um, well, said, just you know, said some soothing words. Um, but uh it it does seem like that um like even for me i mean i've only taken ayahuasca once so i know expert but it seems like ayahuasca will will work through you you take it once and you become this kind of conduit well what would you say about that oh my god i was in an ayahuasca experience um a weekend retreat and uh with my wife and then the shaman from peru he said um explaining to the newcomers um, said, you know, the ceremony may last five or six hours, maybe the rest of your life. And everybody laughed. And I was like, no shit. You know, because I had already done it a few times. Like, so it does stay with you. And it's not a, a presence that you feel or like scary stuff. It's just an awareness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you mentioned, like you become more present and people feel safe and people feel like they can open up and people feel permission to heal when you hold space for the kind of work that you did and you were not doing a shamanic ceremony you were just being present and that in in itself is extremely healing you know like when you you know you're walking in the street and you see somebody make eye contact and smile you know that presence like that changes that person just that smile and that look in the eye you know now imagine like what you did to, with your friend like and then she started crying and she she was the, the um, bringing that up to the surface, it was maybe, I don't know how it went, but that was, to me, it sounds like very um, like necessary at a time. It needed to come out. Yeah, it's like, like you can act as a, a catalyst for, um, yeah, as you said, be, being present and you just ask the right question. Say, say a couple of the right words and then pff, everything changes. And... Uh, I, I actually had this this vision in my ayahuasca trip um, where um, this it it uh, she showed me um, a girl I had dated when we started dating and when we finished dating uh, and I I thought I transformed her and she said no you gave her the space to transform mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it like catapulted into this beautiful vision of like a a cosmic man, like a, <laughs> every part of his his body was a different, like planet or or right. constellation. It's, <laughs> it was amazing. Um, I know there's a uh, in in Brazil. There's a uh, um, it's it's quite popular to be a member of a spiritualist church, and and uh, um, I remember my my friend Mariana told me this story where. Um, uh, well, her, her mother attends this church and sometimes they will, they will try to do work with lost souls and like helping them, um, like guiding them through, through to, uh, another plane or, or something like that. Uh, and one day her, her mother, um, out of nowhere, um, just 
her voice changed and and she was like uh why did you leave me or something like this apparently one uh, in the end they um after her mother came out of this trance they figured out that it was this this lost soul whom they were helping they'd stopped going to church for a couple of weeks and he was like knocking on the door um do you have any comments about that or any similar experiences okay like i have a few but i'm trying to edit my thoughts and see what would be the best like one time um i okay my mom is 72 years old Mm. i convinced her to do san pedro cactus (laughs) (laughs) Um, my brother is about 47 and i convinced him to so they did it together the same day and um my like for the longest time um we felt like presence like a couple of presences in my in my my mom's house that's where they were doing it and um the house belongs to my brother but she was staying there because like she travels from you know she's in mexico and then texas and so on and so forth so i prepared the beverage the beverage and and then they had it and um she came out of her room because she was having some time and and when she um she came out of the room she saw two individual entities just kind of hanging out and they were my mom's like you guys need to leave and then my and the entities were like we're not gonna leave this is not even your house that's like my mom telling me the story and then my mom she, she said that she felt like she was closing up and and she felt afraid but then something some spark came up in her heart and opened up and she said you guys need to leave like she became more assertive and like these spirits left the house and ever since I'm like I have I'm no longer kind of uh, afraid of being in that house by myself like you know it's no longer freaky like she basically exercised these entities that have always been there so and and another one when I was um probably like 5 or 6 years old um my my dad had some issues with his business and they went to see this curandero of sorts and um you know it was like you have to be there between 3 and 5 p.m. if you go at any other time you would never find this person if you asked. They they don't know anything. So like it was a specific time. And, like you, anyway, so after they serviced us, like the person would have be enter into a trance. So um, after they were done, you know, doing the cleansing, whatever other stuff, um, this entity said to my dad, "Don't leave yet. There is an accident that is scheduled for you guys right now. So wait thirty five minutes." So we waited, and then we left. And in the highway, there was a huge wreck was supposed to be meant for us but this entity had helped us out in that regard so i mean there's a ton of stories that i could tell you like that and and like completely like crazy like that so there's um all sorts of like there's some people that are helpful like i've done exorcisms like tons of them as well and like you don't even have to be present to that like i um project myself into places where I need to be at a time. So, I mean, all those things are possible. I mean, I, I've, I've done them and I actually have reviews of people that have written for me mm-hmm. whenever I've done that. So it's not just like me making shit up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've read a couple of them and they're yeah, pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, what would you recommend if somebody say if if somebody's felt felt like their house was haunted or, you know, something was not right about their house, should they, should they seek out, a shaman in the in the area. I guess they can always t- talk to you, uh, or is you know what else would they do? Yeah, I mean, surely asking for some help is uh, wonderful. At the same time, I I mean, I'm not a Christian by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, there's some passage I cannot remember. Like Jesus said, you know, you have it within you. So the idea that just with the story of my mom, you know, she she felt afraid, but then she opened up and told them to leave. Like, you have to feel empowered and, like, you're able to do it. So how can you do that now? Just, it's really simple, just asking, like, okay, we really ask you to leave. And, and I mean, they can contact me and I can give them more, more, like, of what to say, but the idea that they can do it by themselves. Is it scary? Yeah, it can be scary. Um, I had this woman that her husband was taking a shower and then he screamed and he had scratches on his back. And nobody was there. She was freaking out, so she called me, and you know, I, I went there. I projected myself. I mean, they were in like somewhere up north, and I'm in Texas, and I mean that that worked out nicely. Um, it, but a lot of times it may be scary, so I'll, you know, those circumstances help is appreciated. If you think you can handle it, 
um, that's probably even better um, because I think that like you know playing music having light being uh happy a lot of those uh, high positive things are not very liked by the dark spirits so like just your own presence and awareness will drive them out great so mm-hmm. if you play some like spiritual music or like gospel or, or Icaros or, or something like that dude you can play pop music if you want to the point of the matter is your happiness mm-hmm. you know like I mean I um, I don't play gospel music in my house or at cars. I mean, unless I'm doing ceremony. So the idea is what, again, what lights you up? What makes you happy? Play it, dance, have fun. And, um, you know, like tuning forks, you know, like you will change the other tuning fork by your vibration. You just have to have a higher vibration to be able to affect the other one. I've read a few articles over the, over the last six months or so uh, talking about, say, the. I think one of them is titled The, the African View of, of mental illness or the shamanistic view of mental illness uh so uh what's what's your opinion of, about mental illness from this perspective i think i'm a little bit torn on that one because i do think that there is such thing as mental not illness but maybe on balance but i do think that a lot of it is just not knowing what to do with it uh, so yes, I agree with the idea that it may not be what society wants it to be, or that there's no use in society for that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, like that guy that ended up going back to like some the African country and ended up being like the shaman of that place. So, like to me, the way I see it is like you know, after doing some ceremonies, like you start seeing things, hearing things, feeling things, and you think like you're going crazy. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that I understand what that's like. Mm-hmm. So, but the the point of the matter is like. Um, they need to know that that's normal, that that's workable, that you can do things. It's not just like you're nuts because you're hearing things, you know? Mm. Like just the whole idea of if you're talking to God, you're not crazy. But if God's talking to you, you're crazy. (laughs) Okay, I think that's a really good rule of thumb. (laughs) So what about, um, I have heard some some, uh, situations uh, where, say, Somebody suddenly receive, receives a gift, like a large amount of a, a powerful gift, with, which maybe could be used for 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 evil or for you know to to damage others. Um, uh, what would you say to somebody in in that situation if that if that if that popped up like spontaneously? Like if they got a like if they got a gift, or can you rephrase it? I don't think I understand. Okay. Okay. Well, say someone is is uh, someone realizes that they're telepathic, and they realize that they can use it to manipulate other people. Two things, and I think, okay, one, whatever you do is going to come back at you. Mm-hmm. Would you want to do that? And the other one is, it's not virtuous. Whatever it's virtuous, it's its highest purpose, and that's how one, I think, the standard should be. Um, there are two kinds of gains. There's immediate gains and long-term gains. Like, are you going to go for the short term because it seems profitable at a time, but it's going to hurt you in the long term. Mm -hmm. So just being aware that whenever you get something, I mean, it's economics. The whole universe is economics, (laughs) you know? So are you going to get your investment then, even though you're going to lose, or are you going to wait for your investment later? And a lot of times you're not going to get any investment back at all, but that is going to benefit somebody else. Mm. so it's all economics and even in you know the ether so the point is like are you aware of what you're doing and how it's gonna like the repercussions of them yeah okay so you have to i guess just like with anything you have to stop and and ask yourself you know what is it gonna do for you in the long run so um and another question i would have is um i guess uh to to some degree you you want to be perhaps seen as a, as an intellectual or you want to give intellectual insight with say your, your podcast and, and, and things that you write. Uh, do you ever worry that it affects your, your credibility being, being a shaman and being, uh, you know, looking at economics and other things? Unequivocally. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, again, it's just an awareness thing, you know, like I, I don't, the way I see it is like, you can, 
have your cake and eat it too in that regard. Like, cause you know, you can be really, um, providing a lot of value, being really successful, doing a lot of things. Um, and, and then doing the other stuff on the side. And I'm not really public about putting them both together because of that same thing. And, you know, if people ask, if people like, okay, see, here's the thing, you know, you were talking about like ayahuasca being like make, helping you be a vessel. So like, um, it seems like a directory of sorts. Like when somebody needs help, they come to you because of, you know, some awareness in the ethers that you can help them. Mm -hmm. Anybody that approaches you, there is a reason or a purpose for that. So, um, yes, it, it may hurt, but at the same time, like, yeah, it, it seems like I'm able to help people in, in various, uh, arenas. And, and that, to me, ultimately, like that's an investment, a deposit in, in the, um, account of um humankind in general so to me that seems profitable yeah okay so if you like you you speak the truth it's valuable to speak the truth it's valuable for the human race and and i guess it's uh well it's valuable for you too because if you if you live a life knowing the truth and never saying it it's gonna it's gonna damage you well yeah and and the thing like <clears throat> whomever is who whomever has ears let him hear mm -hmm. you know like if that's not their cup of tea they, they don't take it and that's it you know i mean it, it's just as simple as that and um some people may overlook it you know uh, just like the thing that just we just came up um talking to my buddy kenny the 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 past few days he's kind of um he says that um a, a lot of anarchists here at this conference are very uh, left brain, like very lo logical. And he also has connections to like these rainbow gatherings and intentional communities. Um, so very right brain, creative people, um, like hippies, if, if you will. Uh, and so to, to some extent, he's, uh, he's working on this bridge between these, these two communities, which in his, in his, in his mind, I, th I think, and rightly so, uh, they're like this perfect match. Um, I think you're, you're part of that in, in some ways as well, because you have the, you know, focus on, on economics and, and other intellectual pursuits and, and then you have the shamanism. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. I think that either hemisphere on its own is doing a disservice to the person. Mm. I think that, um, when you're lateralizing on one side or the other, is when you feel that the world is a threat, that the other people are out there to get you, that, um, you know, so it, it seems more bellicose. Whenever you have a whole brain thinking, then you're able to see that, well, maybe they're not out, like you You start assuming goodwill. You're like, well, you know, what if they just mean this? Or, you know, or you just ask questions. What do you mean by that? You don't take it personal. I, I just think that um, it takes a lot of maturity and emotional intelligence to be able to put both hemispheres together and use the best of each mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times we demonize those that are on the other side just because we act or sin differently so mm -hmm. how can we um, you know unify all of us and not in a way of like well, let's be a community no i mean Everybody can do their own thing, but just assume, like, assuming goodwill and like, okay, these guys are right brains and this is what to do. These guys are left brains, this is what to do. So, do you think that that um, say shamanism can can help people in the liberty movement uh, expand it or help if, if it will help people who are now outside of the liberty movement enter the liberty movement and see and see the value of it. Well, yes and no. I don't think that it's a necessity. I think there's um I think there's a ton. I mean, this is a tool out of many. Um so I don't want to like, you know, say uh, it requires it's it's a necessity. So does it help? Without a doubt. And you, you know about that like how helpful it is. Does it give you a higher perspective? Yes. Now, my fear is that um uh, you know, the Buddha said that there are only two mistakes in, in your path. One is not starting and two is not going all the way. So like my fear is that a lot of our friends on the, on the right side, no, on the left side of the political spectrum, which are more likely to do these kinds of activities, you know, like the shamanism, I don't think that they go all the way. 
I mean, because like you do grow an appreciation for others and an empathy, but I don't think they go all the way to the point that they don't see how, for instance, taxation is um, unethical and how robbing from somebody else to pay for your preferences is not right, even though the seemingly good intention is there. Mm -hmm. So that to me, that's not going all the way. So how can we help? And then on the other side, like, I mean, you can pick and choose. So the point of I'm trying to make is I think that just, you know, if you're going to do it, uh, I think it needs to be maybe something that you do once a year or twice a year, you know, um, it's not just a one time event. I mean, some people just need it once because they need to heal something. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they want to get into it and get deeper into the um, matrix of the, the universal consciousness, like doing it several times, and uh, so you, your, your heart and your mind can be in sync and they can open. Uh, I saw someone commenting the, the other day on Facebook. There's a, like, I think it was in the anarchist philosophy group or something. And, and this, this guy was saying that, um, when he was in his youth, he, t he tried, uh, many psychedelics, LSD and mushrooms and this and that. Uh, and he said he, he didn't have any real, um, significant, uh, development in, in consciousness because of that. But later when he got into philosophy, um, a, a lot of things, uh, like philosophy helped him to develop as a person and, and spiritually. Um, and, uh, my, qu my question would be, um, does a person actually need to have some knowledge of philosophy before, before having a, a psychedelic or shamanic experience uh, to make sense of it? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, and this is something funny. Um, I, since I have memories in my brain um, and body, if you will, I've always been a geek and inter interested. Like, I mean, I would get in trouble in fourth grade for reading uh, the general theory of relativity and that kind of stuff. But I mean, it was like completely non-related to what I was seeing at the time. So like, because of that background of reading everything and anything that was in front of me, I think that that propelled me and helped me a lot during the path of the entheogens. So, you know, like, um, I was able to see things and explain things because I kind of like, you know, physics and chemistry and, and all these, um, you know, science and all that. So I was able to like put in one side or the other and be able to understand, apply, integrate, and move on to the next thing rapidly. Mm -hmm. So does that help? Absolutely. Is it, is it a necessity? Not always. Like if you have somebody that you can talk with, that has that background. So, um, again, it's not a necessity, but it, it's very, very valuable. Yeah, I guess I have this <laughs> this image of a like a scanner brain hippie, and he's just floating around taking all these drugs, and he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't know what what's what or or um, like nothing uh, nothing from his psychedelic experience actually has any lasting effect because he doesn't know how to c click it in into place. Yeah. So, um, so maybe it's uh, it's a shaman's job as well to have to have that philosophy and yeah. And I, I have a friend, and um, you know, every time he has some problem and happens to be the same one, but just in a different color, I guess. Um, he said, "Oh, I'm gonna do ceremony. I'm gonna do ceremony." So he's done like probably even more ceremonies than I ever have, but he keeps having the same problem. So. The easy work is doing ceremony. The hard work is integration and learning and applying. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can do ayahuasca 5,732 times, but if you don't apply, like, from your action plan out of the ceremony, you're not going to get anywhere. It's just like spending two, three, four hundred dollars and your weekend um, just for, like, feeling horrible and then getting cookies. You know, I mean, to me, it's not worth it. So are you going to like actually do something about it? Like when you when you come out, you know, take some time to um, like like a tea, you know, you're like seeping the tea and, and it until it gets the color that it needs. So like you stay there, like, you know, feel expansion and then maybe grab a book, go talk to somebody that knows about it. And, and I think that's just as helpful as well. So uh, where can we find your stuff? Uh, tell, tell us about what projects you're working on. Um, what are your channels? Thank you. Um, the baby that 
that's getting a lot of attention now. It's uh, Emancipated Human. So we have the website, emancipatedhuman.com. It's on Facebook as well, Emancipated Human. Um, I'm working with uh, Anarchast Espanol and uh, the Dollar Vigilante. Um, v is for Voluntary is also one of ours. And, um, you know, the consulting gig, Trammell, McGee, Cooper & Associates, we do a lot of good work there. And, um, you know, I mean, just find me on Facebook, Luis Fernando Misses, M-I-S-E-S. Yeah, I have to, like, see it in my mind. So I right brain, I guess. <laughs> so, Yeah thankful for this opportunity to um, expand some on this um, subject because I think it's really important. Um, I think that uh, really, really personally, I think that this is the next frontier for um, entrepreneurs and like for consciousness in general, especially for people that are going to make lasting effects in the um, market. So it's like, you know, even John Mackey was talking about spiritual consciousness as a trait of a good leader. So, uh, you know, we're getting there already. Press like on YouTube, press like on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, and Pocket Casts. Follow us on